You know, James, thanks for sharing with us. I know he was very encouraged when he came home and just listening to him share with me on my doorstep there that one late night that he showed up, it encouraged me. So I'm glad that he shared with us. Anyways, I have a question for you this morning. And the question is this, is what do you think is one of the greatest privileges we have as, as men and women or as people that God created? What is one of the greatest privileges we have? And as you ponder that, there's probably more than one answer that comes to our mind. But I'm going to put forth the following. One of the greatest privileges we have is the privilege to do God's will. That's a privilege, to be able to do his will. And do we view it that way? Do you and I view the opportunity we have every day to do our Father's will as a privilege? Because we should and so I'm going to look at a couple of things that Jesus talked about doing God's will, as well as some of the apostles. So there's a couple of verses. One is in Matthew 7, that I'm going to read, and there's one in Matthew 12. This is Jesus speaking in both of these. So in Matthew 7, verse 21, it says the following, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So Jesus is saying, hey, look it. Those that do my Father's will are going to be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at that benefit of doing the will of the Father. Another verse that Jesus spoke on this is in Matthew 12, verse 50. Jesus is speaking to a crowd, and he says, Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And so Jesus is saying, look, it, if you do my will, you can go be part of the kingdom of heaven. And not only that, I'll call you my brother or my sister. I can be a brother of Jesus. Do you, I can be, or you could be a sister of Jesus. Do you believe that? That we can be like a young, he's like my older brother. That's a privilege. And so those who do God's will. Then if we look here in first Peter four, there's an, the apostles emphasize the same idea and the value of, of doing the will of God. First Peter 4. I'm going to read these verses and then we'll just talk about it. It says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. So Peter's emphasizing that because when Jesus came, he sets us free to do what? To do God's will. So here's this privilege we have because of what Jesus did. He's made it so that we can now do the will of our Father. Ephesians 5 talks about this. I think Paul wrote this. He's emphasizing the same thing. Ephesians 5.17, it says, Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So he's emphasizing that we should, we should be seeking to know what the will of the Lord is. We want to be those that do his will. Look at Colossians 1.9. For this reason, Colossians 1.9, right? Paul is speaking again. He goes, since the day we heard of it, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. This is tying into what James shared. And so Paul is saying, look, we pray that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will so that you could do it and be fully pleasing to God. So there's an emphasis, once again, on the will of God. And I'm going to finish this one when it comes to the apostles here. In 1 John, if we flip there, 2.17. It says, And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So we see an emphasis with Jesus saying, Look it. The will of God is important. 
That's how you enter into my kingdom. That's how I'll call you my brother and my sister. The apostles are emphasizing the will of God. Right? This should be important to us. I'm going to even read this other passage in Acts. This is interesting because it's talking about David. And David was a man after God's own heart. Even though he stumbled and sinned, and yet he had a heart after God. Why is that? Acts 13.22, it says, And when he had removed him, that is when God removed the previous king, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Who will do all my will? I think there's a connection. Why was David a man after God's own heart? Because he wanted to do God's will. He wanted to do all God's will, it says. And so we also want to have that kind of heart. We want to be a man or a woman who wants to do the will of God. This is valuable and important. So God's will for our lives is going to have a lot of similarities. There's a lot of verses in God's word that talk about God's will for our lives. But God's will for our lives will also have differences. It's very specific. God knew exactly the spouse that each one of us is going to marry or has married, right? One day. That's specific and unique to you. He has a plan on the career path that you go down. Do we seek him? He has a plan sometimes on where we're going to live. These different things. That's going to be different. Unfortunately, there's a pun there intended. He's not listening. (laughs) Anyways, you understand there's a difference. Does that make sense? And so we need to seek him not only for the general, right? We read his word. It's laying out clearly. There's a lot of things that we're going to give thanks. We're going to learn to possess our own vessel. Things like that. But there's also differences, Right? God has a specific plan for each one of us. But the key is, do we value that? Are we wanting to seek that? Lord, what is your will? Do we want to do that? So I'm going to read <clears throat> a little example here of something. This is about Jesus. And he was able to figure out what God's will was, even though he heard different voices. And you and I are going to experience the same thing. This is in Matthew 16, verse 23. 21. It says, Matthew 16, 21. It says, From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and to be killed and to be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus had a revelation of what was going to come. He spent time with his father. He was up on the mountain early praying. He would study the scriptures. He knew the prophecies of old. He studied them. When he was 12, he had great understanding there in the temple. And yet Peter... He had a good heart. I mean, he loved Jesus. But yet he wasn't mindful of the things of God. He was looking at it from a very natural perspective. And Jesus right away recognized, Jesus, say, Peter, what you're speaking to me is actually what Satan wants you to speak to me right now. This is not God's will that you're speaking to me. My father has shown me I am going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. And you're getting, you're trying to hinder that. That's interesting. Two very opposite things. But Jesus knew the difference. Why did Jesus know the difference? How did he recognize it so quickly? Because when you and I think, we often will hear two voices. We'll often have two leanings. How did he know so quickly? He was so quick to discern, that's not God's will. That's not God's voice. The path I'm on and the things that I've had set in my heart, this is God's will. This is the direction I'm supposed to be going. You and I need to be able to grow into that as well. Number one, I think we need to read God's word, but we need to meditate on God's word. We need to be immersed in God's word. So when those temptations come, we can discern the difference between the voice of God and another voice. 
so that we're not misled. We're not misled. So we need to study God's word to know his will. That's part of it, to know his voice. Why? Because hopefully we value it. Do we value God's will? There is no life that you or I can live on this earth that will be more satisfying and be filled with more joy than doing the will of God. It says that Jesus had more joy than all of his friends. Why? Because he loved righteousness, doing God's will, and he hated lawlessness. Do you believe that? We need to get into God's word and we need to look at what he has for us. He is a good God. Every single thing he has planned for my life is for my eternal good, not just some temporary good. Absolutely. We, we talked about it on Friday. We're going to be blessed a hundredfold on this lifetime and in the lifetime to come, eternal life. So yes, there is natural blessings. But do we want to do God's will? Do we realize that this is the absolute best life I could live would be able to do God's will perfectly every day? Young people, do you believe that? There is no better life you could live than to do God's will every day. We need to get a hold of that. Because if we actually believe that, then we're going to want to know what his will is. Right? We're going to seek to know his will. I'm going to share just a little story from our trip. And the reason I'm going to share it is, you're going to be able to discern it very easily. But when you're the one in it, Sometimes you just sometimes listen to another voice for a few seconds. So you guys know that we were on a trip. We went over 6,000 kilometers, but we had a flat tire. We prayed off and the Lord would protect us, and he fully did. All of a sudden, this thing was got so loud. I'm like, guys, quiet, quiet. What's this? Oh, that's my vehicle. It's not another vehicle passing by. It's like this loud noise. We pull off, and sure enough, we have a major flat tire. And so the whole process went along quite well. And the whole family worked together, and it all worked out that we were able to find a place on a Sunday that was open that could help us. And we went off the road, 22 miles, and it all worked out. We even put a, I've never put a flat, I've never put a spare tire on in my life. I mean, I've changed tires before, but I've never had, I've never, I know there's a spare tire on the van, I don't even know where it is. Like, get the manual out, jail. your job's to read the manual, where do I find it? I know it's under here somewhere, but how do I get to it? So there's a little spot in the carpet that's cut out, and we have to peel back the carpet and put a little thing in there and turn it around. It lowers down. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. I didn't. Anyways, we put it on, and sure enough, it's flat because I've never put air in a spare tire. Who does that? Has anyone actually checked their spare tire for air pressure? Well, you guys are wise. Okay, <laughs> not all of us are that wise. Anyway, so there it is, this vehicle that we've had for 14 years. You know what? It was pretty flat tire. We got it on, but it was flat. So fortunately, the Lord had prompted me to put in my cheap little 12-volt air compressor from Canadian Tire, and it worked to get it up to pressure. And so we were able to go, and Laurel, sure enough, she's on the side. She's calling. Who's open? I'm doing this. Levi's got the jack. I'm doing the tire. Like everyone, Tim's making sandwiches in the vehicle, and everyone's doing their thing. It was so great to see everyone working together, right? And so sure enough, we get off the road, and as we're going, I'm like, well, is there any other options? I should try to get some prices here, you know? Like, I now it got through the major problem. Now I'm thinking, now i got to spend money, right? Like, and then all of a sudden, I talk to one guy. You know, we're just going to go here. And we go here, and the guy has only one type of tire that will fit my vehicle. So I've never heard of this brand in my life. And I'm like, this is probably not the highest quality tire. I'm like, hold on. Lord, you brought me here. Do I have to worry about this? I don't have to worry about this. Put the tires on. Just He's like, you think you're going to get to Canada on these? I'm like, well, I, I know they're getting low. I just thought, might as well wear them right out. It's summer. It's not that big of a deal. Bad idea. Anyways, just put four new tires on. So we get back on the road, and then I'm on the road. I'm like, man, I wonder how much I could have saved if I went to Costco. I could have probably got a tire that was a brand name tire. I've never heard of these in my life. And the other side's like, you're safe. Your spare tire, 12 volt battery compressor was there, a little compressor thing. A guy was open on a Sunday till 3. You got there just before. It's two hours. You're back on the road with four new tires. What voice am I listening to? Did my Heavenly Father take me to the wrong place to get the wrong tires? I don't think so. Does it really matter what name they are? The Lord knows. Does it matter if I spent three or $400 more? Which maybe I didn't. I decided I'm not going to look at Costco because they probably went up since I bought them 10 years ago, whatever it was, five years ago. But... If I spent more, does it really matter? Like, of course I want to be frugal, but at the end of the day, 
that voice is not the voice of God. It's trying to rob my joy and my peace and my thankfulness. So as I'm driving there, we're back on the like, guys, I got two voices in my head. Which voice is God's voice? Right? As I'm driving along, one voice is saying this and the other voice is saying this. Which one is it? The Lord wants me to do what? What do I know for sure? In everything, give thanks. My God is a good heavenly father. He loves me. He cares for me. He's protected me. He's taken care of all these things. This didn't happen around a corner in the mountain pass. It happened on a straight stretch. The front right corner blew out. Do you know what I mean? Literally, there was no tread around it. It was fully off. It was a perfect circle. It was off on the side of the road there. Like It was all tucked up inside there. It's pulled it out. There's just two little frayed sides on both sides of the wheel. Like That could have been bad around a corner. The Lord took care of me. Am I actually worried about maybe saving a few dollars? Like, I mean, come on. Is that what I'm supposed to be thinking about? Not a chance. Two voices, right? God's will is I give thanks. My God, my God is a good God. These are the things we meditate on. These are truths for all of us. Does that make sense? And so there's two voices. One was trying to rob my joy, and one was like, you know what? <laughs> Whose money do I have anyways in my bank account? Whose is it? It's God's money. Who put it there? God allowed me to have it. Do you think it might be for an opportunity to put tires on the van to get the family home safely? Probably. So if he wants me to spend an extra hundred or two and to be able to learn to be thankful while doing it, that's probably more important than saving a hundred or two and grumbling about it, isn't it? Like, you see, like, what's the perspective? And so Jesus overcame in his, which was a much bigger test. But why? He had his mind set on things above. As we're going about our jobs, as we're on our family vacation, as we're going to school, as we're working, as we're in the house, as we're doing all those things, is our mind a heavenly perspective or are we doing it from an earthly perspective? We need to have our minds set on things above. We need to have our minds renewed, right? Thinking about things from a heavenly perspective. Whatever we do, whether we eat or drink or go on vacation or go to work or we're doing diapers or we're doing chores around the house, we're doing for the glory of God. Does that make sense? We need to have the heavenly perspective. It changes everything. It will help us discern the voice, which voice is from God and which voice is really the devil trying to get us to discourage or to get off the path, right? We need to have our, our minds renewed. This is really important. And so I'm going to finish with two verses. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Very common, but it talks about the will of God. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's a lot here. There's a lot here of what he's trying to warn us. What's going to get in the way of us proving God's will for your life, for my life? What is going to get in the way? So we can sit right here on Sunday morning and say, I want to do God's will. But what's going to get in the way of you doing that? Are you willing to present your body as a sacrifice? Are you willing to say, Lord, I want to give you my hands? I want to use my hands. I want to use my strength. For what purpose? To bring glory to God. I want to use my eyes, right? To look at things, to bring glory to God. My ears, the things I'm going to listen to. Oh man, that gossip, it's sure fun. Oh no. I'm going to change. I'm getting away from that. I got to use my ears for God's glory. I want to give my whole body for him. If we're not willing to do that, it's going to get in the way of us being able to prove God's will for your and my life. Next thing it says here, it says, do not be conformed to this world. Do we want to fit in with the world? Is that our goal? Do we want to fit in? Do we want to be accepted by our worldly friends or neighbors or co-workers or teammates or half-hearted Christians? Or do we want to be having God's approval? Do we want to be conformed to the world? Or are we willing to be set apart from the world? 
Jesus says we got to come outside the gate. He talks about that in Hebrews, right? Are we going to be willing to go outside the camp, right? And suffer with Christ. Are we willing to do that? Because if we don't kind of make that decision in our heart, in our quiet time before the Lord, to say, Lord, I, I want to do your will. And Lord, I don't want have anything hindering me from knowing that and proving what that is. And so I need to surrender my whole life. Lord, forgive me for my own ambitions. Deliver me from my own goals and plans. Lord, I want to do your will. We got to we got to make that decision beforehand, not when we're in the situation. When we're in the situation, we're going to get swept away if we haven't in advance made these decisions before you and God alone. Lord, I want to please you. I want to do your will. Then we're going to have an opportunity to pass the test when we're in it, because then we're going to be able to hear the two voices properly. By the renewing of your mind. That's how we're not going to conform. By the renewing of our mind. How's that going to happen? It's not going to happen just in that moment. It happens throughout the day, day by day, week by week, as we're studying and meditating on his word. Right? What songs are you listening to? Is it worldly or is it, well, it's, lo- it's not really bad. Is that renewing your mind? No, we're choosing to fill our mind with things that are going to be pure and noble and good and true and praiseworthy. These are the songs we're meditating on. Man, there's some songs I can walk and I, into a situation, and I can hear one song, and it's like, right away, you know, it's totally ungodly. Most stores I walk into, it's like that. I can walk in sometimes, and I can hear one song, and it's a Christian song, supposedly, but it doesn't do much for me. <laughs> but the next time I walk in, it's like, right away, I was like, man, it just, there's something about it. It's like, I want to actually hear, what are the words? I, I'm, I, get, I can't actually pick out words very well out of music. That's not my strong point. But it's like, what do the words help me? Those are good words. Like, I actually want to hear what they're saying. I can feel it right away. It does something different. My question is, is what are you meditating on? Are you renewing your mind? What are you putting in? What kind of books are we reading? Some people love reading. And you know what? Reading is actually a good skill. It's a fantastic skill because, number one, you get to read his word. But what are you reading? Are they just lawful things? Or are you you are you filling your mind with good things? Does that make sense? And so it's a challenge for all of us. Me too. How, what are we doing? We've got to fill our minds with good things. That's how we can renew our mind. Not be conformed to the renewing, but be transformed by the renew, my, renewing of our mind. That you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is what we want to do. We want to be ones that prove his perfect will. And I thought another thing, I'm going to finish off in Proverbs 3. This is the second verse that I was going to finish with. And I think this is a good one. In the midst of seeking to do his will, is there's a leaning on not our own understanding. We need to actually be willing to walk by faith and say, God, I don't understand all these things right now, but Lord, I need you to direct me. Lord, I'm leaning on you. I need you to guide me. Lord, help me. Right? Three, 3 verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways and decisions and choices, acknowledge him. Bring it to him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And so there should be this underlying leaning, looking to, God, I want your direction. God, I want you to help me. We have to make these decisions. We have to make choices. Even simple things. So God, help me. Right? What, what, what's your will? Lord, guide me. So some things we know, what is God's will? And everything give thanks, right? We always praise him, right? Learning how to possess his vessel in sanctification in a holy way. Those ones are the same for all of us. But what about the other decisions? Are we still leaning on him? Are we looking to him, right? And the bigger the decision, you better have a lot of confidence and be waiting. When it's about who you're going to marry, I'm telling you, you better wait on the Lord until you have full confidence that it's the right one. When it's about some other things that are not near as big of a deal, it's, it's not the same, right? But when it's something like, let's say you're going to go away on a trip, does it really matter if it's 10 days or 12? It's probably not as big. Sometimes, but it's, it's a little bit different. <laughs> Do you understand? There's decisions that are really important. The consequences when you get it wrong are huge. And so you want to know, right? And so make sure that we're willing to really seek his will, Say, Lord, I want to do your will. And I think the key to that 
is when I say you're willing to bring everything to him. Right? That's how, if we don't do that, it's going to get in the way of hearing. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for today. I thank you for the privilege we have of gathering together. I thank you for the things that you showed James and taught him and encouraged him with. I ask you to help us to remember the one or two things that could be applicable for each one of us as well. I thank you also for the fact that we get the privilege because of Jesus dying and rising again, Lord, and that we can be set free from sin, that we can do your will now. Lord, you've given us of your spirit. Lord, let us see it as a pleasure, as a privilege. Help us to seek you, each one of us, to lean on you, to look to you, and to study your word, Lord, that we might know your voice and be able to do your will, that we may be those that would actually prove your will. Help us, in Jesus' name, amen.